Hi, today I want to talk about ledger art, a unique form of Native American art uh, that was made on a ledger paper that was uh, part of the reservation system uh, and the accounting of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, it's, it's a tremendously interesting world of art and let's just dig right in with one of the pieces. So uh, first off we have to deal with the idea of the so-called vanishing Indian. Uh, there's this uh, belief that uh, Indians were vanishing by the late 19th century and actually it's still in effect today. You can often run across people who think that Indians have either vanished or are in the process of vanishing. Uh, the news flashes that they're most definitely not. Um, I first became interested in ledger art in, in the 1990s when I ran across it in the Allen Art Museum at Oberlin College. Uh, and they actually have a lovely collection as does Yale and uh, there's several other collections. Uh, if you're interested, contact me. Um, so I want to talk about uh, this piece called Wohau, Feet in Both Worlds. Now in 1876 and 1877, uh, Wohau was a prisoner at the Fort Marion prison camp in St. Augustine, Florida, about which I'll tell you a little bit more later. Uh, let's just pay attention to the, uh, to the image right now. There's a man between a steer and a bison that might have been drawn from the teepee emblem of a Kiowa medicine man and warrior owl prophet or Skywalker. Uh, so Wohau, the, the man, is between two worlds which not do, do not come together, nor do they come apart. Many people read him as favoring one world or the other, uh, but there's actually two worlds here. So let's look at them in turn. First, let's look at the, the white world which Wohau is looking toward. Uh, there's domesticated cattle, uh, black breath, which is significant in a black pipe. Uh, and note his one foot in the field, that there's farms uh, and uh, an English style house. And his name is in English, not in his, a pictograph. So all of this stuff basically points toward him having a future orientation perhaps uh, toward the white world. However, let's look at the Indian world on the left side of the image. His dress and hair remain Indian. Beneath the crescent moon, the falling star, and the eclipsed sun, all powerful Kiowa symbols. Uh, those symbols seem to end as we move to the white side, indicating a loss of some spiritual connection or force with the adoption of white ways. Then there's the bison. Uh, the staple uh, animal on which Plains Indians uh, depended that was, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the bison has red breath, and, and the breath is a blessing from the animals, a spiritual life world connection. Uh, he's offering a pipe to both, also indicating peaceful intentions and a desire for connection or counsel. Interestingly, even Wohau's name was in both worlds. His original name was Gahade, or Wolf Robe, but he adapted Wohau in exile after the sound non-Indian cowboys made when herding cattle. It came to mean cow to the Kiowas, and some say his name translates as spotted cow. It might mean that Wohau was relating to the cattle in his imprisonment in Fort Marion and the way they were rounded up and taken to slaughter. He has a foot in both worlds, but he's at home in neither. A little bit of historical background, uh, 1890 marked pretty much the end of U.S. conquest, uh, military conquest of Native American peoples. This was the nadir for Native Americans. Uh, we talked about uh, their pre-contact population figures of anywhere from uh, the low counters version of 2 million North American Indians to the high counters version of 18 million. Well, in the 1890 census, uh, there were only 250,000 uh, Native Americans marked in the census. 
So this is uh, uh, the bottom of Native American history, the dark point. Uh, there was uh, disease and warfare, uh, the issues of genocide uh, with, that we talked about with Jeffrey Amherst and his germ warfare, uh, and uh, scalp bounties uh, where basically uh, local governments and military offered uh, rewards for Indian scalps. Now the interesting thing about a scalp bounty is that uh, if if you get a scalp you can't tell if it's an enemy or uh, a friendly Indian so basically it just meant all-out bounty for Indians. So this is a race-based reward for uh, killing Indians. Uh, there were massacres which we'll read about in Dunbar Ortiz and in uh, Ned Blackhawk's wonderful book, Violence Over the Land, last week. Uh, and uh, disease continued to take a major toll uh, on Native American populations. So uh, one of the ways that the U.S. strategized to um, uh, conquer the Plains Indians was to remove their food source by killing buffalo. So. Uh, tourists were encouraged to shoot buffalo from trains. Uh, the military went on uh, expeditions to uh, destroy the buffaloes. Uh, and uh, it leads to lovely pictures like this of 40,000 buffalo hides in Cam Kansas. Uh, generally, the hides were stripped uh, because they could be resold and the rest of the animal was left to rot. A uh, very different practice from Native Americans who used every part of the buffalo uh, when when they hunted it. Uh, so, uh, 1860 to 1890 was the last gasp of the free Indians. Uh, there were massacres at Sand Creek and Bear River that we read about, uh, Little Bighorn, and uh, culminating in 1890, the U.S. attack on Wounded Knee. Uh, after disarming people, they basically just slaughtered uh, people at Wounded Knee in the in the dead of winter, and uh, 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 this b broke the nation, uh, broke the hoop of the nation, according to uh, the the Dakota Indians and and the Lakota Indians. Uh, well, let's take this piece, Fort Wallace, as an example. Now, a couple of things about ledger art. You'll notice the uh, ledger. It's, it's on lined paper, uh, and uh, that the action moves from right to left. Uh, so all of, almost all of the ledgers have sort of a grammar to them. Part of it is this right to left action with the uh, protagonists on the right and their, their goals on the left. Uh, they leave tracks which tell a story. So here we see uh, the tracks of the bullets that are flying past them. Uh, they bravely head in, uh, and uh, one person is down, and you can see this man, whose name is Howling Wolf. Uh, that uh, That's called a glyph. That's what marks him. Uh, he's the author, the, the artist, uh, and he's counting coup on an Indian who is fighting for, uh, for the, the U.S., uh, so counting coup, we'll come back to a little bit later. It's basically touching someone with a stick, your enemy, uh, rather than killing them. It's considered to be braver than actually killing someone. Uh, so here they're attacking uh, despite the gunfire on Fort Wallace. Uh, and uh, basically uh, that I, I, uh, the attack was unsuccessful, but I, I wanted to show you this because of the, it's a very good example of many of the features of, uh, of uh, ledger art. So uh, another feature is the sort of two-dimensional approach. Uh, we don't have a lot of perspective or backgrounds. It's all content. It's all foreground. So every piece is a part of the story. Uh, so this was uh, fighting at Fort Wallace. The result of the fighting uh, was that the Indians who were involved in the battle and captured uh, were shipped out to a prison camp uh, in St. Augustine, for Florida, uh, called Fort Marion. Uh, and uh, w uh, 
They were transported by horse uh, and uh, other armed Indians actually uh, helped move them and uh, somewhat tragically when they transported the prisoners to Fort Marion, uh, the Indian guards who had worked with the U.S. Army were also thrown in with the prisoners whom they guarded uh, into the prison camp at Fort Marion. Uh, this was the time period of kill the Indian, save the man. Uh, and uh, the, the idea of cultural genocide is, is another way of approaching this. So you let the person live, but you destroy their culture and you try to basically beat the culture out of them. Uh, so in conclusion, this was a, a critical moment uh, in uh, Native American history. So what was Fort Marion prison camp like? Well, uh, there was the betrayal of the Apaches, their extra legal imprisonment of 72 Apache, Kiowa, and Plains Indians men that were carried by the train that we just saw to Fort Marion in St. Augustine between 1874 and 1878. Richard Henry Pratt, the author of the phrase, kill the Indian, save the man, uh, was the instigator. He was an Indian fighter in the West, but he, he saw himself as a progressive, uh, someone who uh, actually was on the Indian side. Uh, and he thought their only chance for survival uh, was this kill the Indian, save the man, for them to acculturate into white culture uh, as lower class citizens who would serve and uh, basically do uh, manual labor type jobs. Uh, so he later on went to, on to fame for the Carlisle Indian School, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, and uh, one of the first things that happened is when prisoners arrived at Fort Marion, uh, they were given wool suits, uh, military discipline, uh, the underwear was wool, which was uh, torturous, uh, according to uh, some people who left accounts of their time. Uh, and uh, they, their hair was cut, which had a, a, a real significance in Indian culture. Uh, and uh, military discipline was imposed. They were given ledger paper and watercolors or colored pencils and set loose. Uh, these, this experiment turned out so well that Pratt encouraged them to sell them uh, to provide income for the prisoners or in some case for reservation Indians. Uh, this often showed Indian life before capture, but often it showed life at Fort Marion, as in this picture. Uh, but they were cognizant of their market too, so much of the violence was Indian on Indian, and they began to show other aspects of Indian life. Uh, male Indian art for the Plains Indians tended to uh, glorify uh, uh, martial achievements, so fighting and warfare. Uh, so basically showing uh, brave Indians attacking white people and then selling that to white people wasn't working out so well. Uh, so in the prison camps, uh, uh, Native Americans began to show other aspects of their life. Uh, so for example, uh, there's my favorite, the Indian Prisoners and Ladies Archery Club. Uh, so every week at the uh, at Fort Marion, a group of St. Augustine women would come and learn archery from Native Americans who had developed it on the plains. So here they're showing them, and here's the women, and here's our right to left action, and here's the results. The two that the Indians shot are probably the ones that are in the target, and all the other arrows are on the ground. Uh, so uh, some artists, such as Woha, shifted from events and exploits to self-expression. Uh, there was a transformation uh, along the way, a change in media reflected that reflected a change in society. So this is the idea of mediation, the idea that uh, when we think about media, we're actually changing the content to suit the media. So for that, I want to do a little bit of a walkthrough of uh, kind of the history of Native American and Plains Indians painting. So there's rich and varied media, rock paintings, wampum and beadwork, hide paintings and bark drawings. Uh, there were events and exploits, mostly men. Uh, teepees were decorated, as were shields. Uh, and then there were the winter counts, like this Kiowa winter count in 1833 to 1892. 
uh, on a buffalo hide. Uh, and you can see it starts from the center and works its way out uh, across the almost 60 years. Uh, and each one of these is half a year. So there's a spring version and a winter version that are marked by the, the post here and the tree here. Uh, so, uh, in the early 1860s, uh, this was adapted to ledger paper uh, in the form of accountant's ledger books. So after the ledger books were filled or uh, discarded, uh, Plains artists uh, used traditional paint and bone stick brushes to paint on hide. Uh, this gave way to new implements such as colored pencils, crayon, and occasionally watercolor paints. Uh, and they acquired the paper and new drawing materials in trade, or as booty after in military engagements or from raids, uh, or in the case of uh, Fort Marion prison camp, uh, they obtained it uh, uh, from the commissary of the prison camp. So it calls into question the assumption of unchanging tradition. Native Americans sought out and got new media, but used them in a way that demonstrated continuities with the past at the same time. So writing on ledger paper was a way of engaging with U.S. expansionist power. Double entry bookkeeping was the basis for the record keeping of material growth that fueled expansion. Native Americans knew the power of writing and knew the power of these ledgers, so writing over them is layered with symbolism. So let's look at this one, for example. So there's horses on top of hay, oats, fodder, bedding, and then various kinds of paper and ink. So there's horses versus print and calculations and so forth. Uh, and then if we turn it upside down, we can see here's all of the stuff in the ledger. Uh, oats, hay, fodder, and so forth. And uh, writing on ledger paper uh, was, uh, well, uh, indigenous scholar Anna Bloom writes, like moving into an unknown territory, they weave themselves in the project and weave themselves and project themselves over the logic and space of writing. Once drawn in, the ledger book was for them a talisman of sorts, a meeting place of cultures. So here the horse and uh, the ledger book, uh, where the native warrior repeatedly confronted the elusive discourse of U.S. expansion. So what are the features of ledger art? Generally, they're gendered. They're nearly all by men. They're unmixed bright colors. Their side view, no perspective, no background or landscape, and they capture motion, time, and power in ways that Western art does not. There's a right to left action with, just, with, with a sort of a grammar to it, like a sentence or actor of actor, action, and object. And then there are the tracks, the power lines, uh, about which we'll talk some more. Uh, initially, the content, uh, oh, and then there's rich ornamentation showing achievements in history both in action and by the decorations. And then on some of them, there's lack of facial features, uh, which uh, in uh, uh, therapeutic art is said to indicate uh, uh, trauma when artists draw uh, faces with, without like missing mouths, noses, eyes, and so forth. Uh, initially, the content of ledger drawings continued the tradition of depicting hunting, military exploits, and important acts of personal heroism already established in representational painting on buffalo hides and animal skin. So hunting, uh, notice how much better uh, the, uh, the aim of the, actually let's go back. Uh, how much better the aim of the indigenous hunters is than the ladies archery club in St. Augustine. So here um, we're going to look at a battle. This is a copy of a sitting bull, not the famous sitting bull, uh, shooting a, a white man. Uh, now, Sitting Bull isn't the famous Lakota, but a hunk papa warrior, and this isn't a Fort Marion pick, so he's freer to show the killing of whites. 
Sitting Bull made his own drawings, and then uh, the artist Fourhorns copied them for the Smithsonian. Um, the bullet trajectories and the right-to-left animal a action with the enemy on the left, kind of like a sentence, with Sitting Bull, the, the subject, operating on the object, the shot enemy. No mouth on the white man would possibly indicate trauma, but Sitting Bull's glyph comes from his mouth. So his glyph is the the bull bison here. Uh, and note the hat, which indicates a white person, uh, and the fringe, which indicates a non-military frontiersman. That fringe also indicates a special type of power, as we'll see later, fringe and uh, that sort of vibrating look. Uh, and then note the glyph uh, here and on his shield. Uh, the blood and uh, the trade blanket on the horse, which indicates that we're not talking about some pure traditional society against the incursion, but two uh, very mixed societies, the frontier society of the white people and the Papa society that was under massive attack from the invasion. Now, this was the practice of counting coup, and here we've got one of Sitting Bull's own drawings rather than, um, uh, rather than a Four Horns copy. Now here, notice uh, Sitting Bull's glyph, instead of having a glyph, it just says Sitting Bull, uh, but one of the indicators that he's Sitting Bull is that he has hooves. Uh, he's transformed himself in, in warfare into uh, 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 his, his animal name. Uh, so here, uh, someone is shooting at him. It looks like another Indian. Uh, and he actually cuts him with his coup stick, uh, but doesn't kill him. So uh, note the left to right action. Note the no mouth here as well, and the trajectory of his coup stick. And most interestingly, uh, the hooves instead of the feet and the hand. So here's another picture of Counting Coup. Uh, this one is a, a man by the name of Blackhawk. Again, not the famous Blackhawk of Blackhawk's War uh, 60 years earlier. Uh, and Blackhawk is Counting Coup on an Indian with a gun. So instead of shooting him, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, the, the person with the gun is the person that Blackhawk is Counting Coup on. So this is meant to show bravery. Uh, again, you've got the right to left action. Uh, he's not afraid of the armed soldier uh, and uh, basically counts coup on the Indian, probably knocking him off the horse, but leaving him alive. Uh, Black Hawk is an interesting character. He produced 76 drawings over the course of winter of 1880 and 1881 and received $38 in exchange. In 1994, the book of these drawings, by then in a private collection, sold at auction for nearly $400,000. Uh, so he got uh, about 50 cents a page, and uh, that was then sold uh, in a private collection for $400,000. Uh, it's quite likely that Black Hawk was killed at the Wounded Knee Massacre, uh, and maybe putting a pointed stick to paper uh, was understood as a way of counting coup on civilization. Horse theft was another iconic route to honor, considered braver than killing. Uh, note the hoof marks denoting movement. The iconic horse frame, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the iconic frame house indicating a white person, and note the circle instead of a fence, which indicates a defensive encampment at other times. Now, this is uh, uh, borrowing from the Hyde paintings in the Winter Count tradition. This is a Winter Count by uh, the Kiowa Silverhorn. Uh, the 1853 calendar entry uh, is marked with suicide, alcohol, and then you can see these power lines. Uh, it looks like it had something to do with what looks like the beheading or killing with an arrow of possibly an African-American woman or man, it's hard to tell. There was drinking, a gun involved, uh, and 
all of these lines here, the squiggly lines that we talked about before on the fringe of the white man's jacket, all of these indicate the, the powers of that season kind of going awry. Uh, so um, I haven't been able to unpack this whole story yet, but this, it, there's obviously a, a, a very interesting narrative uh, tied up in this winter count. Uh, besides winter counts, uh, many times uh, Fort Marion prisoners sent uh, pictographic letters. Uh, so in this one, uh, the prisoner, White Buffalo Head, and here's his glyph, uh, is sending the letter to Minimic, his father, whose name is Eagle's Head. Oh, wait, okay, yeah, so this is Eagle's Head. Uh, this is White Buffalo Head. Uh, and he's sending the letter uh, from home to his father in Fort Marion, my mistake, uh, around 1877. So the letter is written by White Buffalo Head, number one, at the Cheyenne and Arapaho Agency, number nine down here, uh, by the road to Wichita, writing his father Minmick, uh, dressed in uh, Western clothing at Fort Marion. Also addressed to Coho, the horse glyph up here, uh, and another prisoner. Uh, the talk comes from Minmick's wife, his two daughters, uh, Turtle and Red Medicine, one of whom, Red Medicine, with Minimix's grandmother, granddaughter, is the wife of another Fort Mary in prison, and Minimix's sister's son, Beartail. They all live at the large lodge over here, 26, uh, since Minimix left instead of in several smaller ones as they did before he left. The camps of the chief's little robe, seven, with his cornfield. Uh, where, where, where did he go? Six. Where's the cornfield? Ah, okay, here. Is this, yeah, that looks like the, oh no, here we go, uh, seven and his cornfield. Uh, worked by Crooked Hand here. Uh, and uh, Whirlwind, eight with his cornfield, 22. on the North Fork of the Canadian River with tracks leading from Agency Stock Superintendent's House, number 29, on Small Creek, uh, 20, to Buffalo Hunt, 30 and 31. Little Medicine's Camp, number 10, uh, with his field 11 that he shares with Big Nose and Little White Man, they share camps with Little Medicine who has one hoe and a wagon. White Buffalo Head's field, see the pictograph, is the biggest, 23, and he uses a plow and a hoe, 24 and 25. So it's basically a letter to say that he's doing well uh, and thriving and kind of not to worry and news from the home front. So this is where everybody is. Uh, you could really spend a lot of time going through this and, and reading all the material in it. Uh, and uh, so after that, I think we just need to pause for a moment and consider a bear smoking a pipe with a, uh, 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 an Indian giving the bear a thumbs up. Okay, now that you've all taken that in, as the U.S. government implemented uh, the forced relocation of Plains peoples to the reservations, a contested process that was mostly over by the 1880s, Plains artists added scenes of ceremony and daily life from before the reservation to the repertoire of their artwork, reflecting the social and cultural changes brought by life on the reservation within the larger context of forced assimilation. So in a typical camp, uh, note the teepees are painted. Of course, one of the kill the Indian, save the man goals was to get the Indians out of their traditional housing, which was mobile. 
uh, and basically move the painting off of the teepees and onto paper. So here we've got a courting scene, uh, and this one kind of breaks down the left to right a little bit, but uh, Koba is courting, and it's inscribed, Koba comes to see Sapinta. Here's Koba, comes to see Sapinta, sits down to watch other woman. Koba goes off and sits down to hide, and by and by the other woman goes off, and Sapinta comes to Koba and they talk. Sapinta, what you want? Me you love? Koba. So this actually, um, besides giving us this uh, uh, indicator into how courtship worked, um, also uh, gives us, well, this one uh, gives us what's known as the x-ray style. Uh, so here, this woman who doesn't look too thrilled about being courted uh, is shown uh, through the blanket. So in order to show crucial information to the story, uh, uh, they use this x-ray style. So also we get from uh, uh, different ledger art uh, rituals of women's puberty. So here a medicine waves a bundle of sweet grass, cherry tree bark, hair from a live buffalo. Uh, the young woman's face is painted red, a sacred cult color that indicates menstrual flow, and she drinks red cherry water from a bowl. The woman must be a moral authority and generous to all, so she gives her fine dress away. Uh, and uh, older women smudge her with sage to purify her. Then uh, in another piece we can see the uh, uh, an anonymous Cheyenne at Fort Marion uh, depicted the sun dance. Um, so uh, the sun dance was men who did not bleed naturally needed to bleed from the sun dance in order to purify themselves. Uh, so they would enter into the area of the Sundance and there'd be a large pole in the center uh, and basically the uh, 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 young men would uh, insert through kind of drilling it in a sharp stick into their stomach uh, and then uh, move away uh, from this pole in a circular dance uh, that would eventually pull out a piece of their flesh and cause them to bleed. Uh, it, it, it looks very painful to me, uh, uh, but uh, basically served uh, a number of purposes uh, to purify themselves in, in ways that they were not able to do naturally in the way that women did. So then uh, this is another Black Hawk drawing. Uh, and uh, these are buffalo dancers, uh, and notice the hoops. Uh, and look at the transformation of the dancers here. Uh, so between this image and this one. So here, after they've done the dances, uh, their feet become cloven like like uh, bison, except for this one who doesn't quite seem to have managed to make the transformation and somehow got a horse hoof. Uh, and then note the power lines. Uh, and I'm not sure what this creature is. Uh, I, it might be some powerful form of corn. I'm not really sure. I've never been able to quite figure that out. Uh, but anyway, this is some sort of power that's going into the dancers. Uh, uh, especially this one that's having the difficult time transforming. So, uh, Buffalo uh, was sacred, so here the dancer is basically invoking the buffalo to the point where his feet are leaving buffalo tracks rather than uh, human foot tracks. Uh, and asking the buffalo to give up its spirit to feed the Plains Indians. Uh, so here it's basically the power lines are the bullets uh, and the buffalo is giving out red breath uh, to indicate that it's going to acquiesce to the hunters.
Now these are some of my favorite drawings. This is also by Blackhawk, uh, a Sans Arc Lakota. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's a common Lakota horse and rider theme, but anything but the usual uh, uh, images of it. So it's a dream or a vision of himself changed to a frightening buffalo-headed man-like spirit creature and riding a buffalo eagle, a flying buffalo-horned, eagle-taloned, horse-like creature mounted by Blackhawk and transformed into a destroyer with mesmerizing yellow eyes and a small, sharp, clenched, sharp, a small, clenched, sharp-toothed mouth. So the destroyers are thunder beings. They're bringing of light. They're bringers of life-giving rain or destruction. And the dots seem to be hail, uh, although there's several different ways you could interpret those dots, as we'll see. Uh, they're associated with the destructive side of storms. And indeed, Blackhawk describes the picture as himself being changed into a destroyer. Buffalo eagles thundered instead of snorting or neighing, and the flash of the thunder being's eyes were the lightning. Uh, the buffalo eagle and destroyer connected by lines of powerful energy running from his talon, the talons of the destroyer to the mouth of the buffalo eagle. So here in both cases you can see the energy lines that connect the thunder being to uh, its mount. Now this second thunder being has a rainbow tail which is also a sign of the thunder beings as well as an entrance into the spiritual world. Uh, not sure what is in the blue one's hands. I've had discussions about this with several people. It could be a canoe paddle to help navigate the sky, acoustic of some sort. The end looks a little like gun stocks, but a, a, a gun with stocks at both ends doesn't seem particularly useful. Uh, or perhaps it's a racket for a game of ball like lacrosse. An Algonquian beliefs to the east, which the Lakotas had, lo had long contact, Thunder was the sound of thunder beings playing ball. So remember the fringe on our frontiersmen way back. The fringe on the rider and mount here are indications of power and emotional charge. So all of this fringe here uh, indicates that we're dealing with a very powerful and charged situation. Uh, thunder beings were not only destroyers but protectors and perhaps Blackhawk was invoking them changing into them as a way of protecting and defending against the white encroachments on Lakota life, which were reaching a peak in the 1880s that would end with Black Hawk's demise, along with 300 others, at the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. Ledger art is still going on. Uh, I'm not sure if the sound is going to come through very well here, but this is uh, Little Coyote Will Learn a Chief Song from Strong Eagle. Uh, and this is a chief song in the background. Uh, this is by an artist, a uh, contemporary artist, who just died, of, unfortunately, a few years ago, uh, by the name of George Flett. It's mixed media. The ledger teepee, so the teepee is made out of ledger paper folded in and attached to the larger canvas, uh, and it's acrylic on watercolor paper. Uh, in this large work of mixed media, Flett has folded a ledger paper page onto Strong Eagle's TP at near Oyakin Creek. Three ghost horses are painted onto the TP, uh, which Little Coyote had enters. Written on the right of the balance figure is on a mountain near Oyakin Creek. He brings a gift carried in his medicine bag to Yoya Melnoops, Strong Eagle. Little Coyote will learn a chief song written on the tent above. Appropriating and reshaping the balance sheet is a way of reducing its power in George Flett's revisionary history. On the other hand, the balance sheet forming Strong Eagle's tent is a sign of the ledger's omnipresence and power. This kind of confrontation is always a part of ledger art. So I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and that's it. Thank you.